Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Scott McMillan. I'm the Managing Director and CEO of Invictus Energy Limited. Our ASX ticker is IVZ and our OTCB, OTCQB ticker is IVCTF. Uh, Invictus is about to embark on a very exciting two-well high-impact drilling program in the Kabora Basin Basin in Zimbabwe, uh, and that will kick off very shortly. The purpose of uh, today's webinar is to run through uh, this additional acreage that uh, was awarded uh, a little while ago. And um, on Friday, we put out some new um, prospectivity uh, updates in this uh, new area. Very exciting for the company, very material addition to our exploration portfolio. And Baobab One will be the second well in the program that will test this uh, highly prolific basin margin play, which um, has a lot of similarities to the East African Rift system, which I will take you through uh, in just a second. So today we're going to talk about um, just a little snapshot of the company, uh, where everything sits ahead of the drilling program, uh, a little bit on Makui One and uh, the, the targets that will be going through, the, the expected timelines for the drilling program, and then the acreage um, in the space and margin area and beyond, uh, what that means for our portfolio, uh, and also just a comparison to the East African Rift System uh, string of pearls. I'll then um, hand over for a little bit of a Q&A uh, at the end for any uh, questions that there may be. So Invictus, um, just as a quick recap before we move move ahead to the main part, is uh, listed on the ASX, our primary listing. We've been around since 2018 when we picked up our position in the Kabora Basin Basin that started off with Special Ground 4571. Uh, and now we've expanded it to include EPO 848 and 849, which is uh, a, a continuation uh, and, and uh, contiguous to SG4571, so it covers now the entire conventional oil and gas fairway in the Kabora Basin Basin. So Invictus has a basin master position. We've got multiple play types, uh, multiple drill ready prospects uh, as well, which were matured through our seismic campaign, the CB21 seismic survey that we shot last year, which the results of with, with were absolutely thrilled, turned out better than we even hoped, uh, and really pleasing to see how. Uh, our portfolio has matured based on the planning and the execution that we took out um, and, and um, delivered from our seismic program. Makui One, the very first well that we will be drilling, uh, and that uh, is the largest onshore uh, undrilled prospect in Africa. Uh, it's 20 trillion cubic feet and 845 million barrels of, of conventional gas condensate potential, 4.3 billion barrels of oil equivalent, an absolutely enormous prospect, and that's across seven stack targets that we will be drilling with the Makui One well. Baobab One uh, is in the basin margin play, different play type. Uh, and again, why we wanted to, to have a two-well drill, two drill campaign is to uh, increase our chances of success at, at opening up the Kabora Basin Basin, testing two different play types as well. It gives you that um, ability uh, to, you know, to have um, a different test and uh, you know, come up with um, two chances of uh, of success across uh, 11 targets in two wells. So, you know, very, very exciting. It's not, you know, this is a very, very different type of drilling campaign. It's not just one primary target in one well. We've got 11 targets across two wells. So that greatly increases our chances of, of finding something uh, across this program. Um, the, um, the other aspect of the business that's been a more recent addition is our uh, in, in Gamo Gua and Sukumi Red Plus project, and that will see the company become the first cradle to grave carbon neutral oil and gas project and oil and gas company in the world. So something that we have been very active on. Um, we've recognized the need um, and, and, and also the almost uh, prerequisite now of, of, um, of companies to have a decarbonization plan. And Invictus has been uh, very active in sourcing our own uh, indigenous plan in Zimbabwe. Um, but, but also uh, organically that we've brought in to the company, uh, which means that we're doing it at um, a much lower cost. We'll generate excess credits as well, which we'll be able to sell on the voluntary market. So a fantastic um, separate business arm to the company. So looking further afield beyond the drilling campaign, um, we've got uh, existing gas cell MOUs in place with blue chip customers uh, in the event that we do find large quantities of gas. We've got fantastic markets, great infrastructure around the region to monetize it in. So we're sitting uh, in a very, very good position 
to be able to um, one deliver expiration success, but two able to to uh, monetize that very very rapidly in the event that we do discover something. L looking at where we sit in the region, we've been surrounded by a lot of activity for um, for some time. Uh, but Zimbabwe, because of its above ground history, um, and and also the fact that when Mobile explored the space in the in the 1990s, they did a huge amount of work. Uh, including 2D, gravity, aeromag, seismic, um, and geochem. But the, the, their assumption was that the basin was more gas prone as opposed to oil prone. And there was no market for gas in the region at that stage. We had some onshore discoveries in Mozambique that, were, that uh, Gulf had, had found in the late 50s, early 60s that still hadn't been monetized by that stage. And so Mobile saw very little point in trying to discover even more gas. Fast forward, though, 30 years uh, to where, where we sit today. and fantastic energy market in the region, um, great infrastructure to get it there, uh, including the Southern Africa power pool. We've got several chemicals as an off taker for, for um, raw gas, and we've got the ability to monetize not only domestically, but also in the wider region into premium price markets. So, um, you know, that probably the other um, contributing factor to this opportunity being uh, sort of uncovered um, in, in a lot of respects was the fact that Mobile never made any of their uh, findings public. Um, all of this data was hidden away at the Geological Survey Office in Zimbabwe. This was in the pre-internet era. Uh, and, and so only through our, uh, our links uh, in Zimbabwe, this company has a lot of Zimbabwe DNA, uh, where we were able to uncover this uh, prolific opportunity, mature it now through, um, through Mobile's work that we inherited, um, shooting our own seismic, uh, maturing our own technical studies, and now find ourselves in a fantastic position with uh, an incredible portfolio. So uh, this is where we sit today in terms of our new prospect and lead inventory that, um, that we have. The original permit, Special Ground 4571, uh, is in this outline that we see through here. This uh, Makuyu uh, prospect, the, the vast majority of it, this is um, sort of high case. Um, Spill, spill point through here um, in, in one of the horizons. So these, these show the, the maximum closing contours of, of um, each of these prospects. Uh, so Makuyu world-class prospect, 20 TCF and 845 million barrels of, of condensate, the largest undrilled prospect in offshore Africa. Um, we have Masasa as well that was mapped off the old mobile seismic. And then in the wider uh, area that we've now picked up as a result of this agreement with the Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, in EPO 1848, we've got this new basin margin play, which has um, uh, also called the string of pearls play. Um, for those of you familiar with the, the East African Rift uh, story and the prolific discoveries made in, in uh, Kenya and Uganda, these form a very, very interesting um, new play type that we've been maturing and, and really pleased at how this has turned out. So uh, just taking a step back to, to where this started off, you can see the old mobile grid here, these faint blue lines um, through here, very, very wide spacing that mobile employed. They were shooting a reconnaissance scale survey, um, but even through that, um, that, that very widely spaced and core survey, we could map this huge um, Wakuyu prospect uh, and, and this uh, Muzurabani anticline. Uh, of the, the paper sections that mobile were looking at uh, though, and, and, and um, when Invictus first started working off of these, these base and margin plays weren't really evident. You know, looking back now, knowing what we know, you can you can probably just make them out if you if you squint. Uh, looking at at the big um, paper seismic sections that were left behind at the geological survey, but when we uh, picked up the original data that was stored in the uh, climate controlled storage room that that Mobile built and left behind all of their seismic field tapes. And we reprocessed this data in uh, 2018 and 2019. We began to see hints of the of this um, the space and margin play. Um, now this um, this is a play that wasn't really around and hadn't really been looked at uh, when mobile were exploring um, the the success further north in, in Kenya and Uganda uh, really came uh, after this. So Imputa and Waraga in uh, Uganda were discovered in 2006 by Harbour Resources and, and Tullo. So way after, you know, the early 1990s when um, when Mobile had left even further afield in, in Sudan, fields like Great Paylog uh, as well. Those were only really in the late in the late 90s when um, when these were found. So this play type 
wasn't really around. And then, you know, more recently in the locker shop uh, in 2012 with Tata Oil and, and Africa Oil. So looking looking at um, at this old mobile data, we can see some of their historic uh, vintage lines through here. And we could just see hints of this, um, these little structures into this uh, basin binding fold through here. This is this basin binding fold in gray. And it's called the string of pearls because all of these prospects sit along that this um, the string, which is the fault, um, and and form uh, form neatly along that basin binding area. So we saw hints of it through um, you know through the old mobile data, um, but and, and so the, the the when we were designing the CV twenty one survey, which you can see here, um, this very very fine infill that we shot, this was really designed to mature the drilling location for Makuyu, but also to infill in the space and margin area to mature these prospects. So taking this from a, uh, a, a quite a conceptual um, uh, you know, idea of a play type uh, based on similar uh, rift basin settings further north in, in Kenya and Uganda, we're really excited of, of how this has turned out and it's better than we thought. Um, you know, these are these are pretty pretty large structures in their own right. Um, I'll take you through Baobab in a second, which is going to be the the prospect that we're drilling um, to test this base and margin play. So we've got great coverage over these now. They're well defined uh, in terms of 2D. And we had the choice of, you know, sort of three or four of these of which ones we were going to drill um, as the basin opener for um, for the space and margin play. So it's um it's been a fantastic development, something that's been matured internally within within the company and and, and we're really pleased at how it's turned out. So the bottom line is we've now got probably one of the best looking exploration portfolios going around. We've got a material amount of running room, not only in the basin margin play, but further uh, to the east with um, with the central fairway play through here. So this is coincident with this, um, this basement high trend that we have here that's formed these big anticlines in the center of the basin. And then um, some of that compressional force caused these gentle rollovers into the um, into the basin binding fault and formed the, these traps uh, through here for the basin margin. So probably our one regret from the seismic campaign last year is we we ran out of time and we ran, ran out of money really to to push the survey further east. Um, but uh, Masumu and Mapani, very good looking leads. They've got some very interesting seismic character, uh, and this has been drawn out of the reprocessing. Um, we, we reprocessed the mobile data again with um, with along with the CB twenty one survey to have um, co uh, contractor and processing consistent data. Um, and really drew a lot more information out of um, out of these. So, look, uh, great portfolio. It, it um, we we can mature Masumu and Mapani at um, at relatively low cost. Macabell as well, but also provides great uh, follow-on targets for us. Um, you know, beyond this campaign. So, looking at uh, at the drilling in a little bit more detail, uh, Makuyu one, which will be the well that will spud first. Seven stack targets uh, in the central fairway. We can um, we can penetrate all of these horizons with the one well, testing them. Um, you know, in pretty good locations. Uh, we're not testing quite at the crest, um, slightly off, slightly off the crest, um, but nonetheless in a in a position where we think we're able to prove up large volumes within each of these horizons. Uh, the second well, Baobab One, will be followed uh, immediately after Makuyu One. The well pad construction has started for Baobab. Uh, already, and that will will follow on as soon as we move the rig from um, from Akuji One. The distance here is roughly ten kilometers uh, between the the two well sites, so that means um, you know in terms of of, of ease uh, in transitioning between these two wells, we're going to leave the the camp at the Makuyi One site and just move the rig to Baobab One, which will save us some time and and money as well. Uh, very very easy drive uh, between the two. There's a brand new highway that's being built, and it actually goes right over the top of of this Makuyu um, prospect. Um, and the tar uh, basically is just, um, when I was there in July, it, um, they were continuing it up past the turn off where we go to Makuyu, but um, it'll be done by the time we, we're moving the rig to Baobab. So very, very civilized in terms of access uh, into the basin for us. Um, one more thing I should mention is that we do have a an, up, an updated, well, 
a maiden prospective resource estimate for um, for the basin margin plan coming out. That's in progress and, and in preparation by ERC and will be released as soon as that's signed off by their principals. Looking at Makuyu in a little more detail. So this is the uh, Exalo 202 rig at the Makuyu 1 well site. We have, um, uh, we're in the final stages of preparation, uh, expecting that spud date uh, to be within the next sort of seven to 10 days. There's just a few uh, bits of maintenance still uh, that Exalo are performing, uh, some critical spares that, that we're waiting on from, um, from Poland where, um, where the company's based. Uh, they arrived yesterday and they're, they're putting those in and testing them now. So we'll get a, a much better idea um, of uh, when the spud date will be within the next couple of days. Um, and then waiting on one or two final bits and pieces from, uh, from Baker Hughes as well, who are doing the integrated well services. So Makuyu will spud in, uh, in September, um, targeting 20 TCF and 845 million barrels of condensate. So overall, the, um, the expected drilling time, we've given a, a guidance of 45 to 60 days. Um, we're expecting 50 days roughly um, in terms of um, our, um, our best estimate. And that will um, will target all of these uh, horizons uh, from the 200 down to the base of the 650, potentially also dipping into, into the 700 in the lower Angwa, which is a, a tertiary target. Um, that will depend on on, um, on drilling performance, though. Um, so we're expecting this to to TD at about three and a half thousand meters. In terms of the um, of the program itself, um, once once the well spuds, um, the first section will be the conductor, which will be drilled down to roughly sixty meters. We'll then cement that in place um, and then drill out the seventeen and a half inch hole down to um, roughly 650, 700 meters, which will be above the the first uh, target of interest, which is in the 200 horizon. And that um, will then run the 13 and 3 8 inch casing, cement that in place, uh, and then we'll be preparing to drill the, um, our first target in the post Andy. We're expecting that um, all things uh, going according to schedule to be within about 14 to, to 17 days or so that we'll drill through that, uh, that first target. We'll then continue drilling um, and we'll, we'll drill until the base of the, uh, the, the forest in the 400 horizon. So roughly 2,200 odd meters. Um, and we'll then uh, undertake a comprehensive logging program while I'm logging. So we, although we do have logging while drilling tools um, that will be able to get real time information from the, the coarseness of that information, um, you know, your, your, um, your sampling rate for, for those sort of tools is roughly one to two meters um, that you sample data over, whereas wireline very, very fine scale uh, around six centimeters um, of, of sampling rate. So much, much better detail. And the aim of that will be to, if we do have uh, success in, in any of these horizons to go and then obtain a fluid sample, um, either gas or oil, and retrieve that to surface, that will be the hydrocarbons to surface are our requirement to declare a discovery. Um, in uh, under SPE laws, not just shows. So we're looking, you know, we're looking for for more than shows. Although it'll be good, early, encouraging signs uh, whilst we're drilling if we do have shows. Uh, however, we need to retrieve um, hydrocarbon samples to the surface in order to declare a discovery. So the drilling of this section will take, you know, anywhere between ten to fifteen days to get to the base of the four hundred. Um, we will then while unlog that, and that will take anywhere between three to five days, depending on um, on how many horizons uh, we need to to sample. And so that will take us roughly to twenty five to thirty days in from spud to evaluate this first whole section from the two hundred through to the four hundred. We will then um, case that off as well uh, and cement it, drill it out, and then continue in the eight and a half inch hole section through the pebbly arcos and in the upper angle, which is our primary target. So again, that'll be another, you know, 10 days worth of drilling or so. So about a week's worth of, of casing uh, operations and then another 10 days of drilling um, or so. And then um, again, further wire line uh, evaluation of this bottom hole section. So that'll take us to roughly 50 days or so. Um, so the, the definitive results will come, you know, for this first whole section, roughly 25 to 30 days, and then for the second whole section after about 50 days. So those are the, the rough sort of drilling timelines for Makuyu. 
Okay, uh, and then moving on to the basin margin play. So uh, casting your mind back to the prospect and lead map, we're zooming in on this basin margin section. You can see here in this red box, and this is where all of these, um, these string of pearls sit along that basin binding fault that you can see through there. So we've got um, some seismic cross sections from four of these, so Baobab, Acacia, Marula, and Mimosa. Uh, and you can see where they sit in relation to the seismic grid up here on the right hand side. So looking at these, all of these prospects, and again, these were, you know, the sort of um, ones that we were tossing up with which ones to drill first. Um, in the end, we chose Baobab for a number of reasons. I'll, I'll run through that in a second. But all of these prospects have a, a lot of similarities. You can see the basin binding fault here, these, um, this dark blue one uh, along the edge. So this is the granitic basement through here, and you can see the, um, the rift shoulders um, that sit prominently above the valley floor. So roughly a thousand meters elevation difference between the top of the escarpment here and the valley floor. And these, um, this compression of this, um, of this basin from north to south form this basement height trend through here. And then um, these little gentle rollovers that we can see into the basin binding fault setting up these traps. So this is the this area that we, we're interested in uh, across this basin margin. And uh, we've got multiple horizons at each of these really, really interesting um, set of, um, of prospects that we have. Um, and again, provides us tremendous running room um, in the event of success because um, you know, these, these things are all lookalikes um, going across here. So really pleased at how this has turned out. Looking at Burbab in a little more detail, so uh, just zooming in, you can see the basin binding fault through here. Uh, we've got closure at multiple levels through here. This, this wedge that we see in here, um, we believe this is the separate, uh, a separate source rock uh, as well that's only found along this basin margin. Uh, it does onlap uh, and get eroded out as we go into uh, further north into the basin center. So up here towards that, um, um, was Ravani anticline. Uh, and so this is a separate depositional event that's not present anywhere else in the basin. Um, displays a lot of similarities to the locker and shale that we see in the in the locker child basin, very similar seismic signatures as well. So this is uh, in addition to the other source rock uh, that's present in the basin. So this is an example of the closure at the 200 horizon that we see through here. So we've got three and four way closure um, so four ways where you see um, complete closure uh, of these um, of these contours through here, and then three-way closure up against this basin binding fault and this fault you can see in grey here. So that's uh, granitic basement that um, we have closure up against. We're drilling on line eight, so not quite on the crest of the structure, um, you know, but certainly relatively close. And and again, we're looking at proving up quite big volumes and we're looking at doing it across a number of different horizons through here. So not often you'll drill the crest, but um, you know, here we're, we're, we're close enough to it. We're, you know, we're looking, we're looking for, for big targets, not just, um, not just small pimples up at the crest. Um, and with this, we've got roughly 16 to 18 square kilometers of closure um, at this 200 horizon through here. So, the reason that we really like this basin margin play is because of the similarities that it displays to these, these other very prolific rift basins uh, further north. And looking at, it, at an example of the Lokichar Basin versus the Kaborabasa Basin and looking um, at the Lokichar on the left here, this is um, the result of Tullow and Africa Oil's drilling campaign. So in the Lokichar Basin, um, We've got the basin binding fault that you can see in light gray through here, and the string of pearls all sitting up against um, this basin binding fault. So forming these similar types of, um, of traps. And um, the results of these have been pretty prolific in Gamia was the basin opening well that was drilled in, in 2012 by Tallo and Africa Oil. Um, I'll take you through the comparison of that uh, in just a second, but we've got you know, a variety of, um, of sizes of these, um, of these discoveries, um, and that's related really to trap size and and uh, and the number of of um, of pay zones within this. It is stack pay uh, as well. Another reason why we like this basin. Um, 
and looking at the play fairway, roughly 50 kilometers led to uh, just under a billion barrels of, of uh, recovery, but also the repeatability of these once, um, once you have successes is a uh, phenomenal 88% success rate in the locker chart following the first discovery. And again, hoping to repeat that in the Kabor of Asa Basin. So one of the reasons we've been focused on picking up the, the entire play fairway is to ensure that, that we have the running room as well, because we don't want to do the hard work uh, of going in and de-risking the basin only to leave all the upside to, um, you know, to people who, who haven't done any of the hard work and, and heavy lifting, uh, you know, they're going to put a, put an application in next to us once we've, um, once you've de-risked the basin. So, um, you know, really encouraged by, by the similarities we see here and looking at uh, a seismic cross-section of Ngamia 1 uh, and Baobab 1 as a comparison. Uh, this is what Ngamia 1 looked like from the pre-drill seismic looked a little bit different post-drill once they went to the quiet 3D. So we've got very similar setups here. We've got uh, the basin binding fault uh, in black here, in the locker chart, and in blue here for, um, for the Kabora Bassa. We've got these gentle rollovers that we can see through here, again, forming uh, these traps against the basin binding fault. And then um, looking at the size estimates for, for Ngamia pre-drill, that was roughly 45 million barrels based, based on uh, five square kilometers of closure. Post-discovery, um, Africa Oil and, and Tullo went and shot a 3D survey. You can see this um, dashed uh, black line through here uh, along the, the basin margin area. And um, the, the structure changed a little bit. It's quite difficult to image against this basin binding fault. It's quite a, quite a steep dip roughly 60 degrees and that does cause issues with um, with, with mapping uh, the closure through here. It's just because of, um, you know, of the, um, the sine waves bouncing off this, this basin binding fault. So once they went and shot 3D, uh, this actually uh, turned into a relatively large closure of, of uh, 25 square kilometers. And subsequently, after a couple of appraisal wells to this, um, this increased in size to just under 300 million barrels uh, of oil. So, um, you know, again, uh, like the like the similarities between Baobab uh, and Ngamia, the fact that it's also stacked. So although these pay zones um, are relatively thin, it does um, it does add up very very quickly. So we've got six pay zones through here. I think the um, the biggest one in Ngamia was um, I think roughly twelve or fifteen meters, maybe twenty or so. Uh, and you can see here where they have um, have tested them. So across those six zones, three thousand barrels of oil a day uh, on test, and the and volumetric does add up very very quickly. Looking uh, a little further north uh, northwest in um, in Uganda in the Albertine Graben, again one of the the, the comparisons that we do like uh, with the space and. So Waragar and Imputa were the basin openers that were drilled by Hardman Resources and Tullo that, um, that resulted in the unlocking of this entire basin. There were a couple of earlier wells drilled by um, uh, Heritage um, that found CO2 just further south through here um, and, and methane, um, but further up uh, the section of the basin uh, in Pusha Warrigal with, with the basin openers drilled, drilled by um, Harbin Resources Australian company and, and um, you know shortly after that led to the takeover by, by Tullo in order for them to gain access to the entire basin. So we've got some of these similar basin margin plays through here. Kingfisher is the big one along this basin margin area, roughly a 300 million barrel field in Pusha and Warrigal. Uh, I think Warrigals are around 50 million barrels in Pusha, uh, 75 to 100, somewhere around there. But one of the other uh, comparisons that is, is relevant for the Albertine is the, the big, in, in the basin centre, we've got some of these big fours um, through here, again, caused by the, the basement high. So in Gasser was a field that was drilled. So this is Lake Albert, you can see in blue, which is an actual lake. Um, in Gasser had to be drilled from the shoreline, which you can see uh, roughly through there into and underneath the leg in order to test that prospect. So big field, uh, but been very, very difficult to commercialize because it sits underneath the leg. Um, and this is where in the Kabora Bassa Basin, where we're very fortunate, the lake um, in this basin is further north in, which is the Kabor, Lake Kabora Bassa in Mozambique. And we're on, um, 
we're on dry land all through the basin uh, through here. So we've got access to the entire play fairway. So big four ways up in the middle in Ingassa. And then as you get further uh, northeast, you come up onto uh, the platform. And this is the Nile Delta play where we see some other very, very big prospects. And this is probably where there's some similarities in uh, further to the east here, where we've got uh, these big leads, Mopani, Masumu, uh, and a few others. So I've got no doubt that with some additional uh, seismic through here, that these will mature into something that, um, you know, we already like the look of them just on what we can see from the old 2D, but um, these will certainly get better with, with, with more data and another uh, exciting area that, that we can chase in the future. Um, yeah, so again, very, very similar. Um, probably less along this basin margin area, um, although some of it is in the lake. So very, very difficult to chase, whereas we're, we're on dry land through here and got, um, got access to all of these uh, along this basin margin area. So looking at Warriga, which was the, um, the basin opener for the Albertine Graben versus uh, Baobab again. Uh, so this is taken on line six, which is further to the west of where we're testing it. Um, but again, very, very similar looking setups here against the Basin Bounding Fault uh, in red through here in the Albertine, in blue through here in the Kabor Bass Basin, these gentle rollovers into the Basin Bounding Fault. We do get some near surface faulting as we do in, um, in this basin. And, um, you know, again, stacked, stacked objectives, stacked pay. And although it's not, um, not very thick, um, you know, only 15, 15 to five to 15 meters thick in terms of net pay. But again, does add up very, very quickly in terms of uh, both resources, um, but also flow potential. So 12,000 barrels a day from these three zones combined, you know, very, very handy. Um, and relatively small closures that we're looking at, looking at here for Warriga, two and a half um, kilometers uh, in terms of its, um, it's rough closure through here if you if you take this um, this dip. So very similar setups and something that we we really really like. Um, and then the final the final aspect I'll run run through is the uh, the carbon offset project which we picked up uh, a few weeks ago. And this is a um, a project that we are really really excited about. It's a real differentiator for Invictus as a company for the Kabora Bassa uh, project in being and having the ability to be cradle to grave carbon neutral. I think that's a it, it's a it's a key difference um, in us being proactive uh, ahead of the curve in finding and sourcing these solutions uh, ahead of a very very um, you know impending decarbonisation requirement for um, for access to development funds in the event that we're successful um, for investors uh, looking at investing in, in responsible oil and gas companies. And, and you know, we, we, we like to um, put ourselves in that category because of the way we go about our, our projects, our relationships with our local communities, um, and also from an environmental stewardship uh, aspect. So in Gama Guan Sukumi, we, we picked up as part of a, uh, a tender uh, process that uh, the Forestry Commission ran. So Forestry Commission in Zimbabwe are our partners in this in this project. We'll we'll share any of the the, the profits from the, the sale of carbon offsets 50-50. Um, this has already had a part of project completed on it that was funded by the World Bank that was completed in 2020. So a lot of the early um, studies work has been completed, the um, biomass assessments, the permanent sample plots. So for us to get this to first issuance um, is not going to be one as expensive, two as time consuming as, as these projects typically are. So we are estimating that this can generate greater than 30 million carbon credits uh, over its initial 30 year life. So uh, take that at roughly 1 million credits uh, per year that it will generate. And that will provide us with the ability to be carbon neutral from the outset and, uh, and also generate excess credits that we can sell on the voluntary carbon market. Looking forward, uh, as the 2030 pledges come in for, for uh, companies that are looking at being carbon, carbon neutral, they will be required to go into the, the voluntary carbon market to purchase offsets in order to make themselves um, carbon neutral or, or net zero. That means that there's going to be increased 
um, demand for carbon offsets and will translate into increased pricing. So from an Invictus perspective, generating these credits organically means it doesn't come at a cost to the company and generating excess credits means that it's actually a, a fantastic separate business arm for Invictus uh, as well that will um, you know, be a very nice little business in its own right. Um, it's, a, it's an indigenous solution. We're not offshoring the problem elsewhere. We're supporting the communities that we work in. And um, it's a really nice tie up between uh, the two, you, you know, what are often seen as, as um, uh, incompatible, um, you know, environmentalism and, um, and oil and gas. This, this will result in you know, us being carbon neutral, um, but also if we're successful, looking at um, decreasing the amount of, of uh, deforestation and degradation uh, in Zimbabwe, not only from in Nguagama and Sukumi, but also in the rest of the country through things like gas to power, where um, electricity shortages are driving deforestation in a lot of areas in the country, not just the ones that we're working in. So we, um, we think this is a great asset in addition to the company. Um, but obviously the main focus uh, coming up will be the two, um, these two basin opening wells. Um, which is going to be a very, very exciting period for the for the company. So, you know, to to be drilling not just um, not just one, but uh, two wells um, to test this basin uh, and test these very, very big prospects. Uh, you know, world class prospects. Really, um, very seldom that you get this opportunity as a junior, um, having such a fantastic position, um, being able to control our own destiny. Uh, in terms of uh, driving the campaign from the seismic that we've done, the, the studies work that we've done um, and all the preparations that we've, we've made and, and going into the drilling program. So really happy with, with where the company sits now. We've, we've set ourselves up for success um, in the drilling campaign and in the future uh, beyond that. So uh, just to wrap up, I'd like to thank uh, all of our shareholders, um, both the, um, the ones that have been longstanding the, the more recent additions uh, to the register. Uh, it's been uh, a privilege to lead the company through picking up this asset, maturing it. Um, you know, we've added a huge amount of value uh, along the way. We're about to, to test two world-class pros uh, prospects. And um, from there, you know, we'll, we'll, um, we'll see where this leads us and hopefully um, be transformative, not only for the company as Invictus, but for, Zimbabwe as a country make a, 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 a huge um, dent in the energy deficit in the region. Uh, and from there, you know, watching us grow uh, as, as, a, as a force um, and an energy provider uh, in, in Southern Africa. So thank you again. And um, I'll now open up for, um, for Q&A. Okay, so we've got... Um, We've got three questions here. So uh, the first one is, will Invictus ever release their internal figures in regards to resource estimates? Uh, so look, we've been very deliberate about this in, in the reason that we've gone seeking uh, independent resource uh, estimates. We've known from the start that um, firstly, uh, with Makuyu being an, an enormous prospect, um, you know, very, very seldom do you um, do you get something this size that hasn't been drilled? And really, it, it's because it's been hidden away due to the above ground issues in Zimbabwe um, and also the, the lack of commercialization options when, when mobile were exploring uh, compared to, um, you know, now where, where we sit and, and the below ground potential. So because it was so big, realized that for us as a, as a junior company going out with our internal figure uh, figures and, and estimates would, I think, lack credibility to you know, to everyone where um, because the numbers are so big that uh, if we put if we put out our own numbers rather than independent numbers, I think people would have a hard time believing us. So putting out uh, our own internal numbers really doesn't serve any purpose. Um, our, our internal figures are a little bit different. They're a little bit bigger than, than what um, ERC have for Maku, but, you know, nonetheless, um, you know, I think. 20 TCF and 845 million barrels is a pretty decent, <laughs> decent, decent target. And, and, and putting out our, our bigger internal numbers really doesn't serve um, much purpose. So we'll, we will stick to only publishing 
um, independent numbers for for the time being as a junior company. Um, obviously, bigger bigger companies, and if we do become a, a much bigger company um, where you've got um, you know the ability to to have um, I guess more credibility post discovery when you've got more data, um, you know that we'll, we'll leave that open uh, in the future, but um, not for now. Uh, okay, the next question is when can we expect an update of press release during the drilling? That is, will there be a press release with every target intercepted or only once the well is completed and logged? So in terms of the, the information updates that will come during the drilling campaign, um, I think from a baseline perspective, that will come after the completion of the, the logging for each respective interval. So that is the, um, that's in the, for this section from the 200 through to the 400. Um, so once we've once we've logged it, that will um, that will be after roughly twenty five to, to thirty days or so. You know, again, this is an drill basin. We have given our best estimates for what this program is going to take in terms of its duration and estimated drilling times, and that may differ. So we will announce results once that activity for that whole section is completed. If we do have, um, I guess, unequivocal results, which would be uh, again, we, we, we're going into an undrilled basin. We're unsure of the poor pressure regime, um, and particularly in this 200 horizon, where we have uh, what we believe is a large um, amount of overpressure uh, caused by what looks to be a, a three to 400 meter gas column uh, across three three individual sands. Um, if we do, if we have got the mud wet wrong, we do take a kick, and we've got to circulate that out and bring it to surface and and um, send it to the diverter, that means that you have retrieved or recovered gas to surface uh, or oil, um, you know, as the case may be, and that is the definition of a discovery, then obviously we will um, we will put that information out because we, we're bound to its material. So I think take the baseline as results only once these whole sections are completed and logged because those are the definitive results. Um, and then um, unless we have, um, uh, something that I just an event that we just described, then um, that'll be the best plan. Uh, and then again for the second whole section, and and remember the primary target is in the upper angle here, which is towards the base of the of the target. That'll come after roughly fifty days. Um, next question is the base the base basin margin have access to another source rock. Does this add to the possibility of a higher liquids to gas ratio in Baobab? Uh, yes, we do. We do believe so, um, and that is because of the age of the source rock um, and uh, and also the thermal maturity of it. So this hasn't been buried as deeply as the, the source rock in the basin center in the kitchen to the north of where um, of where um, Makuyu is. There's a big kitchen through here that's quite deep uh, that is through the oil window and into the gas window. Uh, closer along here, we're much shallower and more within the oil window. So we, you know, our um, our belief is that this is more liquid prone uh, through here, and um, you know that'll be that'll be reflected in the um, in the resource uh, estimates for the space and margin uh, play through here. Um, when does the drilling start? So uh, the drilling will start once once um, Exalo have completed uh, all of their maintenance and and um, and that's all be completed. So that is um, something that you know we really don't have control over. We will drill when the rig is ready uh, and everything, and all the equipment that we require is in place. At the moment, the rig is sitting on zero rate uh, because Exalo are undergoing maintenance. So, in terms of its of its cost to us of of things not starting, we were hoping to start in August, but obviously we've had a few delays. Um, but the most important thing is that we have everything in place so that. Um, you know, we're not sitting and waiting uh, once we start drilling because that, um, you know, then you are on the clock. So um, we'll have a better, a better timeline in the next couple of days once the, um, this critical uh, control loop for the, the top drive has been installed and, and, and initiated. We'll then know, um, you know, have a, have a much better time frame. But the latest information that, that uh, I've been given is in the next, um, you know, sort of seven to 10 days or so. Um, next question is why was Baobab selected for drilling over the larger elongated area 
um, just to the east of the string of pearls. So I'm, this is Baobab through here. I'm guessing he's either talking about Acacia or something along here. Um, look, there was there was a lot of debate. As I said, we had three or four of these that we could have picked uh, in terms of um, which which one would be the, the 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 prospect that we would test the space and margin play with. Um, good problems, obviously, um, but really it came down to to a number of factors: the the um, the drilling trajectory for some of these. So uh, Acacia is uh, with this elongated feature to test multiple. So we're just looking at one, um, you know, one closure across one horizon with this, uh, with this polygon that you can see here. But testing, um, testing the um, the stack nature of these means that you've got to select one of these that that allows you to stack up the the, the structures across all of these different horizons in in the optimal way. Um, so bad bad presented the best um you know the best target in that in that sense uh but we will know a huge amount more you know of course of of all of these horizons once um you know even once maku uh, is drilled before the basin margin so it's going to provide us a huge amount of information this drilling campaign we'll be able to calibrate our seismic um because we'll have detailed information from the wells and we can then calibrate calibrate the seismic response to the um to the well and borehole response that we see, which um, which we haven't been able to do up until now. So that'll again, you know, we'll probably um, once once the drilling campaign is done, we'll have um, we'll be much more informed. We'll have some different ideas about where to go next. Um, the next question is: Doesn't Victor see the CO two or Red Plus arm of the business as a standalone business opportunity, or its commerciality dependent on the magnitude of the exploration success? Uh, so no, this is completely. Uh, separate to um, to the um, you know to our traditional oil and gas business. So again, why we set it up as a separate business arm within the company is because it does it does have the ability to operate on its own. And um, you know there, there, there's some thoughts around where where this goes in the future, uh, whether we spin it off as a separate business arm but still retain obviously the rights to the credits, um, whether it belongs in an oil and gas business. I think if you look at all the majors now. They've taken this exact approach, um, where, uh, uh, for example, ENI and Total are, are, are very big um, participants and developers of these Red Plus projects now in Africa. ENI have a couple in in Zambia, developing some in, in the Congo and Gabon. Uh, Total in the DRC. So, we, um, you know, we we think for the moment it makes sense to keep within uh, Invictus. Um, uh, but in the future, we'll you know we'll see we'll see how things pan out. But uh, there's no dependency on on our ability to um, to generate carbon offsets and 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 the success of our um, you know of our exploration campaign. So again, why we like it is because it is a, its own separate standalone business. Um, so. How soon can we expect the factory one prospective resources to be announced to the market? I'm, presu <laughs> I'm presuming that's Baobab. So um, Baobab um, and the rest of the basin margin, th that that um, prospective resource estimate is in is in progress now. Uh, typically what the process is, is um, so I have seen draft numbers for it uh, as, of, as of last Friday, that's now being finalized uh, by ERCE. It then goes through their approvals process. And once that is, that's got to go to the UK to get signed off by their principles. And once that is completed, then we'll then we'll publish it. So, um, you know, bear from a for, from a serendipity point of view, when we pick pick the well location on line eight through here and where the where the well pad is, um, when um, when Barry went out to to scout it uh, right on the corner of the pad, um, and whether this is by by luck or by by chance, um, it's. Um, it's got an enormous big baobab tree that's going to sit at the at the corner of the pad that we'll we'll leave undisturbed. Um, you know, so good good omen in that in that respect. Um, could you provide an update of the PPSA and Gazette process, please? Uh, will delays to this impact commencement of drilling? So, on the PPSA, um, the amendments to the Petroleum Act, which were tabled in the finance bill, so that was the midterm budget update that the Minister of Finance put to uh, put to Parliament. That is in progress. Um, 
the amendments to that petroleum bill will then enable the signing of, of the, um, the PPSA. So at the moment where it sits is that the PPSA um, has been finalized, but the government has wanted to do this properly and have this agreement backed by legislation. So we could sign it now, but that would mean that it's only a direct company to government agreement. It's not backed by any legislation. And that means in the future that it could be challenged by a new government that comes in, um, by an existing government that says, well, you know, this isn't backed by anything. We're changing the laws. And so this agreement needs to be, be opened up again and, and, and redone. So we want to make sure that that doesn't occur, that everything's done, done properly. Um, this has been in consultation with the Attorney General's office, with the various ministries, so that um, this is a stable uh, and transparent legal and fiscal framework in the future, which will ensure that the benefits are shared equally between us and the country, over and above the, the sovereign wealth funds um, back and right that they have to um, into um, the, um, the wider acreage. So that means that um, you know it's a long-lasting agreement, and uh, everyone is on board. Um, and then the final questions regarding share price. Um, look, to be honest, I think it's um, it's just to do with the placing. Um, you know that, that that seen us fully funded. Um, although you know, disappointing to see the sell-off. Um, the share price will fund. Ultimately, we'll find its equilibrium uh, through the drilling program, whether whether successful or uh, or not. So these are you know these are short term uh, event driven by the uh, the placement that's happened. But ultimately, you know, being a being an exploration company, we're going to live or die by our exploration results. So you know, in in the short term, we um, we can't do anything about that. But um, you know, we're, we're hoping to deliver transformational success to the company and to um, you know, to the country through um, through discovery at either Makuyu or, or Baobab One. So I think that's um, that's it from the Q and A to um, you know to everyone who's who's tuned in. Thank you very much, um, and to all of our shareholders again who have supported us. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, it's going to be an exciting period for the for the company uh, towards the back end of the year. We're going to have results all the way through, um, and we've got multiple chances of of uh, of success. So. Thanks again, um, and um, we will um, host another Q and A uh, post the uh, initial results um, for for this um, for this first whole section to discuss some of it, um, and then um, and then take it from there uh, as the results come in. So um, thank you again for your support, and um, I'll finish off there. Thank you. Cheers.